Hi, everyone. Welcome. My name is Mariah, and I'd like to start off by welcoming all of you to today's event on behalf of the Brooklyn Public Library, New York Public Library, and Queen Public, Queens Public Library's Culture Pass program. I also want to thank our friends at the Bronx Music Heritage Center for being here and putting this event together for all of us. If you aren't already familiar, Culture Pass is a program that allows active card holders with all three of New York City's public library systems to reserve free passes to visit 75 participating cultural sites across the five boroughs. Our normal service has been suspended due to temporary closure of these partner organizations because of COVID-19. So today's free public event is part of a special series taking place over the course of this summer, bringing the cultural life of our city right into your homes. You can find a full lineup of events at www.culturepass.nyc. And I'm gonna just drop that link in the chat so that all of you can see that. I encourage you to check it out. There are going to be programs for, for kids, teens, adults, older adults, and whole families. We also have um, events in languages other than English, like Mandarin, Spanish, Bengal. There's a lot to see. Before we dive into today's fun, I do want to quickly thank our sponsors. Culture Pass is made possible through generous funding from the Stavros Niarchos Foundation, Charles H. Ruffin Foundation, and the New York Community Trust. And our virtual programming this summer is supported by a grant from the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs. The libraries are truly grateful for all of this support. And so now I just want to quickly explain um, if you have any questions, how you can ask those. Um, so if you can see either like in the GoToWebinar app or if you're, if you're joining um, this program through your web browser, there should be an option to ask questions, a question box. So if you have any questions or comments, you can type those in. And then at the end of the program, Elena can um, facilitate um, the, the artists and the singers asking those for you. Um, so again, um, you're not gonna use the chat box for questions, but the question box and for comments as well. With that, I'm gonna hand it over to Elena from the Bronx Music Heritage Center who, who will be kicking things off. Thank you for being with us. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Elena Martinez. I'm one of the co-artistic directors of the Bronx Music Heritage Center. And thank you for coming and joining us in our program tonight. I want to thank the Culture Pass program and Mariah and Brendan for helping us make this possible, this event tonight. And some tonight's program, Healing and Resistance to the Female Voice, Facets of the Dark Madonna. And um, I'm really glad we can do this program for you because um, I've been able to work with all the wonderful women you're going to hear tonight and in various different programs. Um, I have their books, I have their CDs, I have their artwork all around my house, and it's always I'm always glad to get a chance to work with them, um, and on this topic especially. We've done some programs about this, and today this program will look how um, Mary Magdalene and the Black Madonna figures have become inspirations for resistance, healing, and creativity um, for artists and others. And actually, it's really great that we're having the program today because yesterday was the feast day of Mary Magdalene, the 22nd. So today is July 23rd, a day later. And just um, a fast note, um, I'm going to, um, we're going to um, have each of them talk, as Mariah said, for uh, to give short presentations. They're going to give you a little bit of history about Mary Magdalene, the Black Madonna, and then and talk about how she informs and influences and inspires them in their work. And then we'll have a chance for questions. So please let us have your questions. And um, just wanted to, just, just a really fast um, intro, just something I wanted to just mention that, um, you know, by many accounts, there are over 400 um, Black Madonna icons and statues all over Europe, uh, many of them in Spain, Italy, and France. And um, some stories have connected the Black Madonna to Mary Magdalene. So that's sort of like where we're coming from tonight, uh, Mary Magdalene of the New Testament. And, um, you know, she's, she's been, an, as I mentioned, inspiration for, for, uh, many, for many different things, for many different people. Um, one thing I just wanted, I thought a great story, which I had read about um, her work as, um, or how she works as a um, sort of um, saint, patron saint of resistance, in that um, the, one of the most famous Black Madonna icons is the Black Madonna of Sestokova in Poland. And she's located at the Jazra Kova Monastery in Poland. And in the 17th century, there was a fight there, and the Polish armies um, were able to get the Swedes and um, repel a Swedish invasion. And the king there made the Black Madonna, that Black Madonna, the sort of the patron saint of the country. 
So she was, many people made pilgrimages to go there and she became, you know, people went there to get her protection um, and to pray to her. Later on in the 20th century, the anti-communist movement in the late 1980s used the image of the Black Madonna as a symbol of resistance to the Communist Party. Um, so all of the Solidarity Movement and the leader of the Solidarity Movement, the dissident later statesman Le Walesa, would wear them would wear the Black Madonna image on their lapels um, to show, you know, to use her as a symbol of their resistance to to the communist government. So I just thought that was um, a great way to just a, a story about how she's, you know been a symbol for art for politicians as well as we're going to talk about art tonight as well. So just to start off, I'm going to give brief introductions of all the artists that are here tonight. If um I'm going to give brief ones if you want more information on all their incredible work and their work and um, the things that they've done, they um if you go to the Bronx Music Heritage Center Facebook page, all their their bios are there. But just to start off with, our, our first artist today is going to be Maria Terrero. She was born in Santo Domingo in the Dominican Republic. She's a cultural activist and a performer, musician, and dancer who um, started off in the group Asadife in 1990, later became a member of the music ensemble La 21 de la Difusión, and then um, joined also the all, Puerto, all women, Puerto Rican and Dominican ensemble Yaya. And then in 2007, she and her partner Pedro Raposo formed Cumba Care. So she'll be um, our first performer today, and she will be followed by Tanya Tortoise, who is a visual artist. And Tanya, Tanya is from Puerto Rico, and her work has, as a visual artist, her work has been shown all, all over um, the United Nations organization throughout New York City and the Dominican Republic and Puerto Rico, um, the Prague Congress Center. Um, in 2016, she published her book, Painting Mary Magdalene, Little Miracles and Transformations Along the Creative Path. And she also periodically um, creates an artistic event called the Mary Magdalene Celebration, where she brings together artists um, from various different genres um, in this theme of Mary Magdalene. Um, and the whole event is sort of like in the context of a Puerto Rican promesa, an offering to, to Mary Magdalene. She also has a blog and a website, um, magdalene.org, um, where she ex talks about her the creativity and spirituality that, um, about, that she uses with this imagery. Um, after her, we'll be hearing from Raquel Rivera, Raquel Z. Rivera, who is a sociologist, is a PhD in sociology, but she also is a, an incredible performer. She has her band Ojos de Sofia, which released the album La Siete Salves de la Magdalena, um, which wove together different Caribbean, Caribbean musical genres into songs about um, representing Mary Magdalene. She's also a founding member of the group Yaya, which was mentioned already, and she's been part of the Puerto Rican bomba group Alma Moyo and the Borico Roots music band Yerba Buena. She's also the hip, the author of the book New Rican from the Hip Hop Zone and the co-editor of Reggaeton. And then after her, we will um, end the show with Alessandra Belloni, who is an artist, artist in residence at St. John the Divine Cathedral. She's also the artistic director and leading performer of Il Giliate de Piazza, if I'm saying that correctly, an ensemble of musicians, vocalists, and dancers that specializes in Southern Italian music and theater events going back to the 13th century. And she's also author of the book Healing Journeys with the Black Madonna, which was published in 2019 and has been sort of number one in Amazon in the dance category. So with that, let's wel um, welcome our first performer tonight, Maria Tadero. Um, thank you, Elena, and thank you, Mariah, for all your support to um, make this happen. Um, my name is Maria Terrero. I am, as Elena mentioned, I am a performer and cultural activist. I'm not going to mention the groups that I was in and all that, because Elena already did that. Um, my career, like she said, started um, in the late 80s um, when uh, I was searching for, for my identity as a woman um, and as a Black uh, woman. I come um, from the Dominican Republic and um, came to New York City, um, where I lived most of my life. Um, and there, um, a group of friends were in the same search that I, that I was. And um, that, that eventually became a Salife. And that's, you know, when my whole journey started as, as a dancer, as a uh, backup vocalist, and um, since then, I have done um, immense amount of growing and, and learning. Um, I learned to turn poems into songs. So I'm a, I'm a songwriter too. 
Um, and um, I learned from aspects of, of my culture that were unknown to me um, for most of my life, um, like salves. Salves is a, is a, is a, is a, is a type of song um, that we play that women and men play in the countryside of the Dominican Republic. By now, it's very spread. It's spread throughout all the country. And because of, of the work of, of groups like Casal Fe, Pumacare, Yaya, and uh, um, now this music is, is very, uh, you know, it's beginning to be known more. Um, I learned about La Ventina División, which is the belief system um, practice in the Dominican Republic, um, of which um, Santa Marta is, um, is a part of. She's, um, she's a female energy in the, in the pantheon of the, of the Ventina División. Um, she's a warrior. She represents strength in our, in our, in our culture. Um, many of the, of the deities um, and, and energies in, in the in the Ventuna Division um, have corresponding elements of, of nature. Um, in Santa Marta's case, her element is the snake, representing um, ancient times and um, and the uh, the ability to heal. She's she's a healer. She's a warrior. Um, and um, as I said, an advocate. Of, of, of people when, when we're feeling down. She's an advocate of, of children. Um, so I will be singing at, at the end of, of my presentation today. I'm going to be singing a um, folklore song um, to Santa Marta or Salve. Um, and I'm also going to be sharing one of my songs in, uh, in our CD. As, as Elena mentioned, Pedro and I have um, Rumba Cabe, and in the back you can see the promotion for our CD, Fruto de Mi Cosecha, which you can find in digital platforms. And there you will find Espiritu de Agua, one of my songs. And that's another song that's dedicated to uh, a feminine um, um, energy in, our, in, our, in the Caribbean, and, and that is Ana Caona. And that song is called Espiritu de Agua. Uh, and then I'm gonna share a song that's not um, has has not been recorded. You know, I, it's a song that I wrote, and it's called Madre Tierra, um, and it's celebrating our connection to to nature, our um, and um, in our our ability as women to um, um, procreate. Um, I'm gonna oh. These are some of the instruments that, that are used in, in salves and in traditional music in the Dominican Republic. This is the pandero, it's a, it's a hand drum. I'm not going to play it because the acoustic in the room um, will disrupt everything. <laughs> um, and these are the maracas, um, which are also very much used along with um, atabales and marcie and all that stuff. Um, so I'm going to start with Espíritu de Agua. Salio de Moño. One thing I want to say is um, in Dominican Republic and many other parts of the world, we use the system call and respond. But in this case, I'm going to be doing both. So I'm going to be doing the coro and the, and the solo part. Salió del bohío, va camino al agua, la reina. Un gaviota de agua, espíritu de agua, aire, fuego y tierra. Está en la plegaria de la reina al agua. Ay, mi ae, mi reina va. Va para el bohío, ay, de madrugada. Ay, mi ae, mi reina va. Va para el bohío, ay, de madrugada. Teri llorando en casi bajagua, mujer caína que amaraba la tierra, veneraba el agua y adoraba el sol. Ay, mi ae, mi reina va, va pa'l bohío, ay, de mandar. Ay, 
Ainia es mi reina va a pago yo de madura que llegó mi reina de madura llegó cantando de madura llegó bailando de madura debajo del agua de madura el areito de madura indiana ahora de madura indiana ahora de madura mi pieza de oro en son de amistad Vio con tristeza que la encadenaron con sella de agua, aire, fuego y tierra. Está en la plegaria de la reina del agua. A usted, espíritu de agua, ven. I'm going to show you a little bit. Thank you from uh, Madre Tierra. And as I said, Madre Tierra is not. Um, Record it yet, and it goes. Tierra, oh, tierra, oh, humedeces mis plantas, me estremece tu calor, oh, madre tierra, oh, madre, oh, infinito es mi vientre. Como infinito es mi amor, el agua corría, santo de mujer, canto de profecía, el día le vio nacer, tiernecitos labios, su pecho amamantaba, y el rey de la mañana, mi horizonte abrió, tierra o oh, Tierra, oh, humedeces mis plantas, me estremece tu calor. Oh, madre tierra, oh, madre, oh, infinito es mi vientre, como infinito es tu amor. Infinito es mi vientre, como infinito es tu amor. Infinito es mi vientre. Como infinito es tu amor. Now, last but not least, um, our song to our female energy today. And um, this one I'm bring memories to Raquel because we used to sing this with Jagger. <laughs> Santa Marta es la dominadora. Y a la culebra que no suba ahora, ni esa culebra que no suba ahora, es de Santa Marta la dominadora, Santa Marta es la dominadora, y a la culebra que no suba ahora, cintura de fuego siendo frenesí, es que Santa Marta anda por ahí, Santa Marta es la dominadora, y a la culebra que no suba ahora. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Maria. That was really incredible. And um, so um, we now move from um, the Dominican Republic and um, the and Maria singing to the sisters of the of the Black Madonna to um, Tanya going to give us um, talk about her artwork uh, as a painter and um, and talk about the, some of the history of the Black Madonna and the Magdalene. Thank you so much, Elena. I'm so happy and honored to be here. So I will be sharing um, some of my process and some connections uh, between Mary Magdalene and the Black Madonna. And if we could, go to the first slide of the slideshow all the way up all the way up all the way up an image with some big eyes i'm so sorry let me do this Well, in the slideshow, you'll see some of my art. Oh, there we are. 
Okay. So this is uh, a presentation I titled Mary Magdalene as the Black Madonna. And I want to show you the next uh, image. This is the very first painting I painted of Mary Magdalene. And it's a mother and child image. And if you see in the background, there's a halo. And well, um, before this, I had been painting uh, images of mothers and children and babies. And this was sort of like my first step into uh, connecting what I was doing previously to starting pa painting Mary Magdalene. Um, I got very inspired by a story uh, where Mary Magdalene is a mother and she's the mother of uh, Jesus Christ's child. And because I was painting mothers, I uh, immediately wanted to paint this image. And if we could go to the next slide. So after painting Mary Magdalene, and if you see in the background of Raquel's um, altar, uh, that is my second painting I ever painting of Mar painted of Mary Magdalene. I started painting Mary Magdalene influenced by what I was reading and what I was discovering at the time. And this process, um, in this process, I was not alone. I was accompanied by my friend Raquel. And that's why she has that painting with her because she was the first one to see it. And um, we, we would uh, spend mo uh, Saturday mornings in my studio just talking about what we were learning. and. Um, we even had a little miracle happen. And this little miracle was that one day I was uh, uh, walking in New York and I found this little uh, image of uh, the Virgin of Chestokova, one of our favorite uh, black Madonnas. And I bought it for Raquel, thinking of Raquel. And then when she came back from uh, Montreal, where, it's, where she went for a weekend, uh, she comes back and she has a gift for me. And that gift was exactly the same card of the Virgin of Chestokova that she had bought for me. So I thought, wow, that's amazing. <laughs> Next slide, please. I wanted to make a, a more clear connection to, to what goes on in, in the artist's mind and how um, the Black Madonna and Mary Magdalene started connecting in my, in my mind, uh, obviously inspired by Raquel's love of the Black Madonna and the, the Virgin of Shestokova that you just saw, uh, in my interpretation, of course. Um, this, um, this aspects that I have integrated into my painting of Mary Magdalene um, are the title Our Lady, because most of the Black Madonnas are uh, given that title, Nuestra Señora, Our Lady. Um, also, I paint the Sacred Heart or the Immaculate Heart, and I uh, painted on Mary Magdalene in a lot of the paintings, and it may be transformed into different things, but it's the same idea of uh, the heart of an illuminated being. Um, then uh, she's also dark, like the earth, like Maria uh, connected uh, to Santa Marta, uh, earth um, just connected to the roots of human beings. And then she also has iconized and face, and I studied the traditional iconography and sort of adapted it to my own um, iconography and, and ways of painting. And I always um, try to use the eyes in the way that um, traditional iconographers work, making the eyes uh, sort of like the center of power of the image. And also you'll see a halo of light, which is very common in, in paint. Um, but I don't paint it in gold or in or as a round uh, image, but more as a as a light coming um, around the the figure. So if we could go to the next slide. Um, so who was the who is the Black Madonna? Um, you've probably seen this image, or if you haven't, this is the Virgin of Chestokova that um, Elena mentioned. And that also attempted, I also attempted to paint in a previous image with Raquel's story. Um, and she is uh, very common um, to see as an image or as a statue 
in European Catholic churches and of course in our in American as well because that influence um, comes from from Europe and Catholicism um, and this usually the statues and paintings are believed to be very mi miraculous um, they they heal they um, they give fertility and they have a secret identity next slide So what are the origins of the Black Madonna? Um, so let's think about what happens to an image of a god when a new religion arrives. It is either destroyed or it is transformed. And I think the Black Madonna's skin, skin color may indicate that she was actually transformed. And the image that you see is the Black Madonna of Rocamadour uh, from France. So it's believed that it's a very ancient statue and that it may have been um, originally a statue of a, of a goddess, of a pagan goddess. Uh, next slide, please. So why is she black? Um, many people think it's referring to the uh, Song of Songs, I am black but beautiful, Negra sum sed formosa. And another theory is that the Black Madonna is the ancient earth goddess transformed as several um, ancient goddesses were represented black, including Artemis of Ephesus, Isis, Cybeles, and Ceres or Demeter. And uh, they, they're they usually goddesses connected to the earth or earth uh, mothers. Um, next slide, please. Um, so the Black Madonna is very familiar to us. We've seen her many times. Um, but let's see in the next slide for an image that might remind us of something. So if you see this image, um, we're going to see the Black Madonna. This is the Virgin uh, of Montserrat and a statue, an ancient statue of the goddess Isis nursing her son. So these two images, if we look at them, they, they connect. They're very similar or at least in my eyes and in other people's eyes. Next slide, please. So what is the connection between the between Mary Magdalene and the Black Madonna? Well, um, the Black Madonna may not have been originally an image of the Virgin Mary, or, but of an ancient earth goddess um, that were adapted or syn syncretized with uh, Christian um, mythology. Um, these ancient statues of a mother holding a child may have been given a place in Christian churches by assigning them a Christian character. And the belief in Mary Magdalene as the wife of Jesus Christ and mother of his child was hidden by worshiping her in the Christianized figure of the dark Madonna. Next slide. So this is one of my Mary Magdalene's. This is Mary Magdalene of the bees and it was inspired by um, the connection between uh, Mary Magdalene and Artemis of Ephesus uh, is a very strange statue that looks as if she has many breasts around her. But um, some people have uh, discovered that these are not breasts, but um, that they are bees, bees, um, uh, you know, in in progress. Uh, so there's a connection to this ancient history and I tried to um, bring it into my own um, iconography that I assigned uh, Mary Magdalene by painting bees around her heart. This is uh, probably very small in the, in the screen, but um, if you go uh, to my website, you'll be able to see the image and, and see the details. Next slide. So the Christian Bible does not mention that Mary Magdalene had children, but in medieval times in the south of France, there were people who believed that Mary Mag they, they had a different belief. They believed in Jesus, and, but they believed that Mary Magdalene was the mother of Jesus' uh, child. And these people were named, uh, that were called the Cathars, and they were the actual victims of the First Crusade. The First Crusade did not happen in the Middle East, but in the south of France. Next slide. And how did Mary Magdalene arrive? This figure from Palestine arrived in the in the south of France. Well, uh, Pope, this is 
a popular legend. She is said to arrive with two other Marys in a, in a place uh, nowadays called San Maris de la Mer. And she preached to the people there and converted um, the people of the south of France um, uh, to, to Christianity, but they developed their own uh, brand of Christianity and they were called the Church of Love. Um, and in this specific place, there, were, there was a very important um, site named Ratis, um, where the three goddesses, Cybele, uh Isis, and Artemis were worshipped. So it was a very important site of goddesses, uh, and then Mary Magdalene appears in this same site. So it's a connection. Uh, next slide. Mary Magdalene as the Black Madonna. Um, this, all this myth and stories continued, and the Templars, who were the, 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 the soldiers that went to the Crusades, um, they are, they are believed to have brought some, some ideas from the Middle, Middle East and from all the cultures that they encountered. So they are also believed to have kept that belief in Mary Magdalene as the wife of Jesus alive and sort of um, uh, secretly in their temples and through the Black Madonna. Next slide. And uh, in conclusion for myself, it's all about love, um, that essential part of all of us, the mother archetype. And, you know, it always comes out. It's just part of our human journey and our human heart. And it's present in all of us. And uh, I would like to show you a few of my artwork related to the Black Madonna inspired um, by, the, by the, they're called the Dark Magdalene series. And this is a more like straightforward uh, Black Madonna. This was presented at the Bronx Music Heritage Center uh, in 2018, uh, thanks uh, to Elena's invitation. And she inspired me to continue creating um, with this theme and it started evolving. So next uh, slide, please. And this is uh, one of the Dark Magdalene's and this is the Dark Magdalene um, of community. And that's why she has a bee in her chest because the bee is a symbol of community. Next. And this is uh, another version of the black, uh, the dark Magdalene inspired by the black Madonna. And this one is titled Spirit. Next. This one is uh, titled The Virgin's Heart. She has a blue background. Um, and I was uh, sort of mixing up um, the idea of the Virgin Mary with uh, Mary Magdalene. And, you know, the, the color blue is representative of the Virgin Mary. Um, but I always paint Mary Magdalene with the colors of the earth. So for me, this is um, kind of a mix of both of them. Next. And this is titled Mary Magdalene's Garden. I wanted to um, just uh, let you know that the sort of writing, mysterious writing in the background represents all the stories that we have never read or learned uh, and that are sort of floating in the background. And we are, as artists, are trying to perceive and bring forth in our art. And next. And these are my websites. I would love to connect with you. So come visit. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Tanya. And to everyone out watching out there or as part of the webinar, please go to her website, check out her artwork is incredible. Support, you can support the artist, go look at her artwork, go Maria CD is available. She, she sang one of the songs from, um, you can support the artist and, and listen to this incredible, either listen, to their great music or see their artwork, um, please support them. And um, so thank you, Tanya. And then we're going to go from to Tanya to Raquel. And they have a connection, of course, because as Tanya already talked about, they worked on some projects together about this topic. So Raquel will talk a little bit more about that. So please welcome Raquel Zivivera. Thank you. I am so glad to be here. 
Um, and I want to start by singing a song, one of my songs, to Mary Magdalene. It's called Salve Reina, um, and in English, it's Hail Queen. Salve rosa del cielo, ay mi estrella la luz. Salve reina, salve dulcísima María, y llena eres tú de gracia. Salve reina, salve, salve la Monserrate y salve la milagrosa. Salve reina, salve, salve virgen de alta gracia y salve mi dolorosa. Salve reina, salve, salve virgen de regla y salve la caridad. Salve reina, salve, salve reina. Salve reina, salve, salve la Magdalena y compañera mía. Salve reina, salve María, te cantamos con vela prendida. Salve reina, salve, salve reina. Salve reina, salve. So, um... That, as Tania said, that's one of Tania's painting. I love that painting. Officially, it's called Maria Magdalena, but unofficially, my nickname for her is La Que Sabe, She Who Knows. And it has to do with many conversations that Tania and I had based on many things we read, many things we felt, and it eventually ended up being one of my songs in the album of songs for Mary Magdalene. So that song that I just sang to me is like my manifesto slash love letter to all the Marys, um, especially all the Black Madonnas. Um, but it's also like my claiming Mary Magdalene as my personal Mary among the Marys. So that's why the lyrics mention many of the Black Madonnas in the Caribbean, La Monserrate, La Caridad del Cobre, La Virgen de Regla. Um, and, and the song also, I didn't sing those verses, but the song mentions um, the Virgin wearing blue and white, as Tania mentioned, um, blue being the color of the Virgin, and then Mar Mary Magdalene wearing red and black. Um, and red is usually associated with Mary Magdalene. So that's a little bit um, about that song. Um, I was brought up as a child between the Evangelical Church and the Disciples of Christ Church, which in Puerto Rico are very fundamentalist. The good part was the music, the music with the tambourines and the dancing in the church. That part was a lot of fun. Um, it also gave me, in theory, the theoretical, ethical um, grounding that I still think sustains me today. But otherwise, it was a terrible, traumatic, fear-induced experience. So I turned completely away from religion, spirituality for about 10, 12 years. When I was 10, I decided I was an atheist. God did not exist. None of that made any sense, goodbye. So I concentrated on my studies. Um, when I got to be an older teenager, I got involved in political activism in Puerto Rico. Later, I went to New York City. And what happened in New York City is that a lot of the political movements that I was involved in um, that had to do with um, the rights of Haitians and Haitian Dominicans in the Dominican Republic, the independence of Puerto Rico, um, organizing against police brutality in New York City. It's like the these political activism communities were intricately connected or, or were communities of faith and communities of spiritual and traditional cultural practice, especially among Caribbean people. 
So that's how I started opening my heart to um, different spiritual entities. And some of the entities that most caught my attention were the Black Madonnas and all the female spirits associated with them. Um, partly, I think it had to do with having grown up in fundamentalist Protestantism, where there's a male God, a male son, and the Holy Ghost is definitely not female. So all, um, yeah, all aspects of the divinity did not include any femininity. So suddenly, I'm being informed and inspired by all these virgins and spirits and many of them are warriors like that to me was mind-blowing so as elena mentioned and tanya showed but i want to show her again because she's just so gorgeous um la virgen de chestokova um she's in the caribbean just like you mentioned elena that there's these um stories in europe related to her um in the island of Española, like there's all these stories associated with her and these amazing um, reasons why she has those scars under her eyes. And it has to do with her fierceness and her commitment to justice, um, her involvement as an inspiration of spirit behind the Haitian revolution. So this to me was something else. Um, this was not this repressive spirituality it was a spirituality that had practical applications that people healed themselves and organized their interior that healed families that healed communities that communities were using and continue to use for um individual and collective healing and liberation um, so let me check my notes just to make sure. Oh, yes. And then how I came back to Mary Magdalene. One, one day, um, as part of these communities, I used to be part of the musicians that um, were playing at San Romero de las Americas Church, a church that was very involved in um, political activism in New York City. And a young deacon was giving the sermon on the day of Mary Magdalene. So she described how nowhere in the Bible does it say that she was a sexual worker. Like that is not in the Bible. And I thought I knew the Bible. I was beat upside the head for years and years with the Bible, but I just bought into the popular myth that was spread um, that is not in the Bible, but that Mary Magdalene was a prostitute. Um, and the Catholic Church like tried to fix that in 1969 and acknowledged that the anonymous sinner in the Bible is actually not Mary Magdalene, but in our popular culture, like that's still how we see her. Um, so that shocked me so much because the interpretation that the deaconess gave, it, it was a young woman, Daniela Martinez, her interpretation was that she was the co-leader of that early Christian movement alongside Jesus. Um, so I was just like, oh, isn't this typical that the most important disciple gets demoted as if it was an insult? I mean, people earn their living through sex work. You know, it's not you know, it shouldn't be considered a terrible thing, but of course, in our patriarchal patriarchal culture that's a terrible thing to call a woman and even if she's redeemed later so that's why I fell in love with the Magdalene because she's a leader um and it just connected my love the love that I learned to um express and have for all these spirits and virgins it connected it to my past my very traumatic <laughs> fundamentalist past and I was able to reclaim the best of that past, especially because the music that I was now singing to Mary Magdalene with was very similar to that music from my past.
Um, and I actually forgot to look at the clock. How much time do I have? You're just about there. I didn't know if you want to show a clip or something before you go or you're. Yeah, let's do that. If Mariah, if you can show um, the dancing for Mary Magdalene clip, and then I'll talk a little bit about why I wanted to show that little clip. And that was taken at the Mary Magdalene celebration that Tania organized in El Barrio in 2016. to show that because that's why these images are powerful because I'm able to connect with Tania and for years develop art alongside her. I connect with Maria and for years we sang songs together and created music together and then from that very personal art that Tania and I made then a whole community comes together to celebrate whatever Mary, that last song is just to all the Marys. So I think it, that clip really shows the joy of people coming together to celebrate whatever Mary calls to their heart. So thank you so much for the opportunity to share this with you. Thank you, Raquel. That was great. Um, and we're gonna, um... We have some questions. We do have a couple questions from some people in the audience. We'll get back. Um, we'll, after Alessandro, we'll get back and, and ask the panelists a couple questions. But right now, I want to introduce our last presenter. Um, we're going to go, um, she's going to take us back to Italy and the, the Black Madonna shrines there, some of her work there, and, and some of her music. Alessandro Bellone. Thank you very much, Elena. It's great to be here with you virtually. I'm used to be with you in the Bronx. <laughs> And thank you for bringing together powerful women. We, I think we're going through a very challenging time, so we really need to um, be the warriors and really bring up Mary Magdalene, the Black Madonna, the Divine Feminine. So my work has been devoted most of my life to the worship and the tradition of the Black Madonna in the south of Italy mainly, which has taken me also in other parts of the world. And going to France in Saint Marie de la Mer, it's where I discovered what I had already read or learned is that there is a connection between the Black Madonna and the Mary Magdalene. I did not really learn that in the south of Italy, but in France it was very clear. So because yesterday was her feast, before I speak more about the south of Italy and show some clips of my research there, I would like to do a prayer for Mary Magdalene that I wrote when I went to this sacred place. So San Marie de la Mer in the south of France, is where it's believed that the Mary Magdalene arrived as she left Alexandria, Egypt, with the other two Marys, Mary of Jacob and Mary Salome, guided by Joseph of Arimathea. In this place, there is a huge statue of the Black Madonna called Santa Sara la Kali. Kali connected to the Black Goddess of India, and she's the protector of all the gypsies from around the world. The place is an ancient site, also devoted, like uh, Tanya said, to Cibele, Artemis, the goddess of the moon. There I had a very mystical experience, very hard to describe in a very short time, but it's in my book, Healing Journeys with the Black Madonna, which is 435 pages. So I want to do this prayer offering to all of you listening and to the world, because we really do need the healing. And it's, the, it's really dedicated to the Mary Magdalene as the Dark Mother, one of the myths say that Santa Sara was possibly her daughter, the daughter of Mary Magdalene and Jesus, who were definitely not white. They were North Africans and they were brown. So that's another important statement. I think it's important to make. 
Sainte Marie de la mer, vous êtes notre mère. Sainte Marie de la mer, vous êtes notre mère. Sainte Marie de la mer, pleine de gîte. Sainte Marie de la mer, pleine de gîte. Vous êtes la dulce noire, la chante pour toi. Vous êtes la vieille noire, la chante pour toi. Sainte Marie de la mer, vous êtes la Madeleine. Sainte Marie de la mer, vous êtes la Madeleine. Santa Sara la Cali, you are the Black Madonna. Santa Sara la Cali, you are the Black Madonna. Mother of the waters, we come to you for blessings. Mother of the waters, protect us from disease. You are the Black Madonna, we will sing for you. You are the Black Madonna, we will dance for you. Santa Sara Lakali, you are the goddess Isis. Santa Sara Lakali, you are Aphrodite. Santa Sara Lakali, you are the Mary Magdalene. Santa Sara Lakali, you are the Mary Magdalene. Grazie. So in my research in the south of Italy, which never ends, I've been doing it for 40 years. As I started in 1980, I saw all these incredible statues and icons of black Madonnas, and I was very intrigued by the fact that they were black. And of course, when we asked the priests, they would always give you the wrong answer. It's a candle smoke, or she's black because she's black. So I was curious to find out what they meant, because I knew those were the most miraculous places where people went there for healing and the miracles still happen today. One of the most important uh, in our in our culture, there are there is a legend that there are seven sisters, seven Madonnas, there are seven sisters. And the last one was believed to be the ugliest. So she ran away to hide on a high mountain. And when they found her, the pilgrims had to really walk really hard, they saw that she was the most beautiful of all, and she was black, and they called her Mamma Schiavona, the serving mother, and that's the ancient site of La Madonna di Monte Vergine, which was a sacred uh, place of the goddess Cibele, the black goddess of the earth, for which people still today in the south of Italy will still honor her with these large drums. Uh, our tradition of pre-Christian devotion to the goddess has never changed, so it's very unusual that in a Catholic country, people do these pagan rituals, and we do that. And these dances and drumming are sensual, again, connected to the uh, sacred sexuality that was part of the devotion to the goddess. So the inscription on that, that statue and another important statue from Sicily, from Tindari, is Nigra Sum Sed Formosa, which means I am black and beautiful. So I would like uh, Mariah to show that uh, statue from Sicily. Tindery. I have a clip from a video. I have some clips. Uh, now after the book, I'm working on making this into a film. Hopefully it will happen. So this statue is a very ancient one. And if you can see your clothes, there is an inscription that says Nigra Sum Set Formosa. So this is probably one of the most ancient shrines of the Black Madonna. Arrived through the sea, just like most of these statues, like the same for the one in France. She came from the sea, from Africa, from some people say Ethiopia. So there is the connection of the Queen of Sheba, the Song of Solomon. Nigra Sum said Formosa comes from that, the Song of Solomon. 
and she also represents not only the Earth Mother as a living being, the goddess of the sea and water, but also the African Mother. So the, the other part of our tradition in the south of Italy that is very special, people have not lost their connection, not only with the Earth Mother, but with the African Mother. And again, I feel like today we're in such a um, crazy time where really people should acknowledge this and it would help us immensely to create more justice and equality. So that uh, statue that is so ancient has a devotion of people, again, pil pilgrims and going up the mountain and praying. Um, but I, I wrote a song for her called Nigra Sum Set Formosa. I just want to play a little bit of that prayer because I do want to show you the other two very powerful statues. But this is a prayer that I wrote for the opera that I wrote, The Voyage of the Black Madonna. And it's in Latin and it's uh, dedicated to her, the dark mother, the African mother. Nigra, nigra sum, nigra, nigra sum, nigra sum, nigra sum, nigra sum, ser formosa, nigra sum, nigra sum, nigra sum, ser formosa. Ave Maria, magna mater, se la maris, grazia plena. Ave Maria, se la maris, magna mater, grazia plena. Regina celis, rifugium, rifugium peccatorum. Beate Maria, liberorum, beate Maria, virginis. Mater Deo, Clement Sophia, O Ducis, Virgo Maria. Mater Deo, Clement Sophia, O Ducis, Virgo Maria. Mater Amata, Intemerata, Ora, Ora, Pronopis. Mater Amata, Intemerata, Ora, Ora, Pronopis. Nigra Sum, Nigra Sum, Nigra Sum, Se Formosa. Nigra Sum, Nigra Sum. Nigra sum se formosa, nigra sum, nigra sum, nigra sum se formosa, nigra, nigra sum. So like the other wonderful women that are part of this panel, we are all inspired by the Black Madonna, the Dark Mother. This has been happening for thousands of years. It's just her time now. This is what I strongly feel that we need to bring her out. So I want to show this other two clips from Italy. One of the most important um, connection of goddesses of pre christian devotion to the Black Madonna is Isis, the goddess from Egypt. And uh, in the book that I've been reading, which is really mind blowing, it's called Magdalene Mysteries and the Left Hand Path. They connect her really to her Madeline being a priestess of Isis, and then she had a very deep knowledge. And this black Madonna is called Our Lady of Freedom, La Madonna della Libera, in a town called Moiano, not far from Naples. To me, um, I love them all, but this is the one I'm most devoted to because I received a miracle from her. And you can see in this, Video when I took it, I had no idea, but you see the light hitting her center star. I received the miracle from her when I first went there in 1987 with my ex husband who had problems and uh, it wasn't really free. And we were praying for freedom, and that center star started to move. And this was not um, an illusion, it was real, and we received the miracle from her. And then I looked at that video. I I think, yeah, that was it. So she's called La Madonna della Libera or Brunetella, the little dark one. So in that area, near Naples, it was a very strong devotion to Isis. Most people don't know that. And I just learned that uh, in this book that Mary Magdalene was initiating in the mysteries of Isis. So that's her connection to Egypt, of course. And that the women initiating those mysteries use their left hand to heal and also to play certain instruments. And I found that out just short 
time ago, and I'm a left-handed percussionist, and I use the frame drums also to heal people, especially women who've been traumatized by abuse. So I had no idea that by doing this, playing with my left hand, as a healer, I was continuing this ancient sacred tradition of the priestess of Isis, of which Mary Magdalene is believed to be part. So I think I, we should close my section with the Madonna of Our Lady of the Poor. I think there is a really uh, important clip to show where you see in Calabria when they worship her. Here you should play the sound and take my voice out. You can hear the drummers playing an African 6A rhythm in devotion. Can you put the sound on? Can you hear it or? And here are these giant puppets that you can see they represent. Only in Calabria. They represent the African king falling in love with the Italian queen. And then they dance and they kiss and embrace. So bringing together the African tradition with the Italian. And the last clip you can show is of the Madonna coming out of the church in this town in Calabria, where I normally end my annual pilgrimage in this fantastic place. But this year, it's not happening yet. But we will go back here. If you can show her, it's a beautiful, beautiful statue, Our Lady of the Poor. She's called Our Lady of the Poor because she was found under the ruin of a burnt temple, probably to the goddess Artemis, or it's possible the meter, and only the poor people could lift her. When rich people tried to lift the statue, she became heavy. And when poor people left, lifted her, she was light. And that's a tradition of many of these Madonnas, which we could speak for days and days. Uh, they are also the ones that protect you from the, the outcast, the people that don't fit in. They go to the Black Madonna and receive a miracle, like the gypsies in, in uh, San Marie de la Mer. So it's not so simple to explain who she is, the Black Madonna. Tanya did a great job, but she is all of that. The pre-Christian devotion to the goddess of the earth, the moon, Chibele, Artemis, Isis from Egypt, but also the roots of humanity, the African mother. And in our tradition, they say that a black meteorite fell from the stars and landed in Anatolia. And then she was carved into the statue of Chibele, then brought to Rome. That black stone is the same black stone worshipped in La Mecca. So if the Muslims and the Judaism and the Catholic would understand that we're all one, we all come from one mother, the black mother. So the original title of my book was God is a woman and she's black. But uh, by the publisher, it became Healing Journeys with the Black Madonna, which is the subtitle, which is here. You can, uh, if I can show it, I want to show it because the cover is done by a friend of mine, um, Arden Mason, who was inspired by Mary Magdalene. And the cover actually has the, the staff that she holds that you will see in one of the circular places, which is Glastonbury, England. I think my time is up, right, Elena? And yes, thank, thank you, you so much, Helen. I love you. We should be doing this all the time. <laughs> thank you so much, Alessandra. Thank you. That was great. And um, I just want to let everyone know out in the audience, um, we have a few questions. I'm going to ask the, the, the artist right now. You still have time, though, to send in a couple questions. So, um, you know, Please take the time now, ask something, they're here. You have, the, you have the artists live, you can ask them anything. I'll start off with the, um, one question. Alessandra, since you just spoke, um, someone asked, if it's not too personal, can you, talk, um, can you talk about what was the miracle that you received from the statue? I can because it's in my books. My, my ex-husband uh, had a lot of problems. He, he suffered from a very heavy addiction. And at that time, when we went there, he was only free for a short time. He was not actually even free. Uh, we went there to pray to this Madonna. We were lost. We thought we were somewhere else. And the caretaker said, go in. If you need a miracle, she will do it. La Madonna della Libera, she will free you. How did he know that this man wasn't free? And when we started praying and we saw the center star move like that, like inviting us, we he went through a big transformation. This man was not 
that spiritual at that time. It was very much sex, drugs, and rock and roll. This was, you know, a long time ago, but it was from the 70s generation. He went through a transformation. He became sober. He was healed, and he was freed, and then moved here and lived with me for a long time. And he became really devoted to the Black Madonna. So the vow that we had to make a vow, this is important. If you ask for a miracle and you receive it in our tradition, I think it's all over the world, you make a vow that you will go back to see her. So we went back to see her every year on her feast day, September 8th, when, where you would find women chanting and chanting for her for 12 hours, asking for healing. That's great. That's great. And like, um, you know, as, as, um, as you're listening, you know, if you want to hear more about that story, get her book, Healing Journeys with the Black Madonna, so you can hear more about um, her, her journey through some, some of these um, sacred sites over in Italy um, or in Europe. Um, we have a couple questions. One question I want to ask Maria. Um, someone had asked, could you show again the statue of Santa Marta so they can really get a good look at, at her? Wow, it's beautiful. And something I wanted to like expound on that, talk about that was, um, you know, in a lot of um, Afro-Caribbean traditions, you know, the names of saints are used to hide the names of Orishas or gods or something. Who would Santa Marta sort of correspond to? Would you, um, unmute, or just unmute him. Okay. She's, um, uh, she has different names. Uh, the Lubana, she has um, in, in Haiti, um, She's um, she has a different name. I know that also in in the Ventuna Division, um, there's different like um, areas or yeah areas of um, uh, you know the the the, the luas that are um, related to to fire or to water. She is with the with the earth um, um, spirit with the Gedeses. Um, the ones that take care of the cemetery, um, that take care of, of, of those who go before us. Um, and she's also a mestreza, um, which is uh, a, a, a feminine energy in the, in the Pantheon of La Ventina Division. Oh, okay. But she's called um, Lubana. There's actually a two Santa Marta's, one is a, yeah, because of the statue, the, the statue that represents her, there's one Santa Marta that's standing up, she's light skinned and, and, and she's stepping um, on, uh, I, I think, no, she has, yeah, uh -huh. that's the other, Santa Marta La Blanca, that's Santa Marta the White, and then there's Santa Marta La Morena. Um, so that, mm -hmm. That's interesting, and maybe um, Raquel or, um, Tanya might know more of this. So isn't Santa, yes, yeah, Saint Martha, you always see her in France. It's like she she fights dragons, right? So is Santa Martha like another, I guess she's another version of Mary Magdalene? I, I, as I was hearing everyone talk, I said, oh my God. And like um, um, Alessandra said, you know, the day we come to understand that we're all one, um, that would be a great thing. <laughs> Um, because yes, it's um, she's uh, she's a warrior, um, and, and like if you want um, a, a miracle because uh, uh, because you're sick, because your child is sick, because um, some injustice has been done to you, um, you go to Santa Marta, you you pray to her, you make offerings to Santa Marta, and you know miracles miracles um, do happen, and on 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 like the um, how you know the establishment has has tried to demonize everything about us um it's you know in my years of of, of looking for for who i am I, i've learned so much about these deities these these energies these spirits that you know they they are with us they and and, and they are with us to advance and to do good Thank you. That's, that's great. Um, uh, have a, this is a question for everyone, um, if any, whoever wants to take this. Someone asked, is, um, can dark Madonna and black Madonna be used interchangeably? Or and is, is there a difference in, is there some sort of difference if you use the term, how you use the term? Can I say something and then Tanya, I think? Okay. In a way, they become interchangeable, but 
the dark matter is more the universal meaning that we come from one mother, the dark mother. La Vierge Noire, the Black Madonna, is really specifically certain ones that have been known in Catholic countries to be protector of certain places and certain location and the miracles that they make. I think they are interchangeable, but the a dark mother, to my opinion, is really more the universal mother we come from, and the Mary Madeleine is one aspect of the dark mother, but La Vierge Noire, the Black Madonna, is really more that particular goddess that became the Black Madonna. And one thing I want to add that I forgot to say that all Catholic countries around the world have a Madonna protector and she's not white, she's black because the Christian church had to do that. They could never stop the worship of the black goddesses. So in neither is Loreto, Apollo is Chastakawa, Einstein in Switzerland, Montserrat in Spain, Chartres in France, you can keep going. So. And that goes back to the universal mother, which is a dark mother. Does that make sense? <laughs> Tanya, did you want to add? Yeah, I just wanted to add that um, I would say that the dark Madonna and the black Madonna is the same, or, you know, and also considering Alexandra's um, interpretation, I would say that I completely agree but that I may have confused the audience with the title of my series, which is The Dark Magdalene, which is uh, sort of inspired by the Dark Madonna or the Dark Mother, uh, just using that reference. But it's, it's two different things, the Dark Magdalene and the Black Madonna. So I have a question now. Tanya, there's another question for you. Um, is your Magdalene of the Bees is very reminiscent of the Yoruban Orisha Oshun. Was that an influence as well? I have been asked that question about several of my pieces. Um, when I sit down to paint, I just let anything that, that flows in come out. So I'm not thinking of anything in particular. It's a sort of prayer or meditation and a way to sort of channel um, what's in the air. So I've been um, touched by many cultures and many influences and many readings because that's how I uh, mostly relate to the world by reading. Um, so I don't doubt that some of that has filtered. Um, and if uh, honey and bees are a, a reference, then I'm sure it has filtered. Um, but when I was um, painting that particular piece, I was uh, thinking, like I said, of the goddess Artemis of Ephesus and that particular statue, which is, um, it's always been very interesting to me. It's a very abstract kind of uh, ancient artwork and and very misunderstood. So that was my, ref my mental reference at that time, although the spiritual references are always, um, you know, there and coming in. Um, so, um, another question. Thank you, Tanya. Um, uh, I am interested in Magdalene in the Caribbean and African descendant nations. May Raquel and Maria go into more detail about that. I, um, I'm I'm not an expert in this in this particular topic, but I do know that Amalia Belcan in the Puerto Rican spiritist Sancista tradition is her equivalent. However, um, my that's where my knowledge of that connection stops, just at the name, because the way that I've explored. The figure is going back to my evangelical past, um, <laughs> as opposed to connecting with um, spirits of the Afro-Caribbean tradition, which I've done with other spirits. But actually, that question, you know, puts a little, you know, question in me. Like, ah, interesting. But who did you say? Who did you say she was in the um, spirit spiritismo? Amalia Belcan. Okay. who is connected to Belie Belcan of the 21 Division, who are heir 
yeah, the element, their element is air. Okay. <laughs> Maria, did yeah. you want to come in? <laughs> yes, yes. I, I wanted to say that um, um, something that uh, is still persists in, in uh, unfortunately, in uh, even even in, in, in our uh, spirituality in the Dominican Republic, um, you know, Magdalena is still referred to you know the prostitute the, the one you know the, that idea that um at some in in, in some levels um, i know there are very elevated um, spiritual leaders that um don't necessarily um represent this um and i have also heard that Anaisa, in this case, which is uh, 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 Santa Ana, the mother of, of, of Mary, in, 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 in some, uh, some altars in the Dominican Republic, she is seen as la esposa de Believelcan. She's seen as um, Believelcan's wife. So, like Raquel, I'm not, I'm not, a, I'm a student. I, I've been a student all these years of, of who I am and where I come from. Um, but, um, you know, in my experience throughout the years, those are some of the things I've been able to um, capture that, you know, there is still work to be done around, um, you know, the, 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 the feminine the feminine presence in, in, in our traditions, you know, where women play an incredible predominant role in the countryside, playing the salves, um, which are the songs to originally were the songs to the Virgin. And then they 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 mix with the uh, with the African elements and that's how um you know salve also has Valsier and, and, and Guira and, and those instruments. Um I I hope that helped with the question. Yeah, th thank you. Thank you, Maria. Um, we have one last question. And it, it said, and this is for anyone, um, but um, does anyone know any more information on the Black Madonna of Montserrat? They said in France, I'm assuming they mean in Spain, and her possible connection to Mary Magdalene. Um, Alessandra, did you want to, you said you want to take that? Yeah, well, first, it's important to clarify that Montserrat is a very important Black Madonna in Spain and not in France. This is the one on my drum, for which uh, actually I would like to just show that there is an incredible uh, tradition of medieval chants called Le Livre Vermeil as prayers to the Black Madonna of Montserrat done in the Middle Ages and still today in certain places to heal people from the plague. And this was something that I wanted to close with because we're in the situation with the virus. And the one I've been um, teaching and doing online a lot is Cunctisimus Concanentes as devotion to the Black Madonna of Montserrat. Uh, in France, there is a devotion to the Mary Magdalene. She was supposed to have lived in Southern France and died in a cave where be they believe she spent they say 30 years only living on uh, the um, food that came from heaven. And I've never been to that cave, but I know it's very sacred, but it's not the same. So the Black Madonna Montserrat and the Mary Magdalene are really not the same. I know a lot about Montserrat and I know that music. So, uh, Elena, can I just show that prayer for Montserrat since somebody asked about her as a last thing? Um, yeah, yeah. You're gonna just, play it. You're gonna play. I'll play it, but it's you know I'll just do the the. It's called Cunctisimus Concanentes, but the reason I would like to do it because I want to offer as a prayer against the virus, against the plague. Cunctisimus Concanentes, Ave Maria. Cunctisimus Concanentes, Ave Maria. Cunctisimus Concanentes, Ave Maria. Cunctisimus Concanentes. Ave Maria, Ave Maria, Ave Maria, Ave Maria. The song is much longer, but I just wanted to give that prayer 
as a healing chant against the plague as they did in the Middle Ages. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alessandra. And I want to thank all the panelists. Um, there's one little comment. You guys have, I guess you guys can probably see some of the comments, but I just want to say someone wrote this, and this is um how I think we all feel. And I just want to say this is not so much a question, but I just want to express how amazing this panel was. I'm sitting here overwhelmed with tears and just how beautiful and strong these figures are and how you've been they've been altered to fit patriarchal values. The panelists were so wonderful and graceful. Thank you so, so much for this. So that's I think. Um, our my feeling as well, and I think a lot of people's feelings. I want to thank Raquel Zivivera, Tanya Torres, Maria Terero, and Alessandro Bellone for this incredible panel. We'll be at um, Culture Pass and the Bronx Music Heritage Center. We'll have it up at some point um, for a link that you can check it out. Um, you can go to the Bronx Music Heritage Center Facebook and get um, more information on all these artists. Please check out their website. Go buy their CDs, their books, their artwork. It's they're all, it's really incredible, all their work. And again, I want to thank them all. And I want to thank Mariah for doing all the tech work and um, tonight and Culture Path. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yes, thank you all so much. Thank I hope you, you all have a